Ego is a real problem in this industry. Everyone oh, thinks they're the smartest. And if you don't have good people around you to call you out and say, bro, you're giving into your ego a little bit. You got too many people around you on that job telling you the greatest thing ever walking to actually ups upscale your level. You have to consume data of a high level so that you can start regurgitating and expressing yourself at a high level. The difference between the phenomenal leader and the okay leader is how well you are able to read and interact and react back to people. Different people have different things that work on them. Some people you can motivate them with, listen, if you get this done, I'm gonna give you $10 extra. Some people don't care about that. If you are the kind of leader that can't pick which one of the two, or you can't detect which one, you, you're not gonna be a good leader. This video is being brought to you by Level Up in Tech. It's Q3 in 2024, but you still have time to get into the cloud. With the quick search for cloud in Indeed, you can see over 44,000 jobs are listed that is related or pertaining to the cloud. Now, that is a lot. But if you're watching this right now, you might be thinking, well, how do I learn the skills to get into the cloud? Well, we got you covered. Level Up in Tech is one of the best, if not the best, program related to getting people into the cloud. At Level Up in Tech, you can learn about server config and troubleshooting, the AWS cloud, infrastructure as code, CI, CD, scripting, containerization, and more. And also, they now also have a new multi-cloud AI engineering program that is dedicated to help you have the latest and greatest skills to help you be marketable in this tech market. They post more testimonials than almost any program that I could think of. Check them out. Wow. If you're ready to start your cloud career today, then use the link in my description to go to levelupintech.com forward slash tech so you can start your career. And plus, they'll know that I sent you. But on to the video. Welcome back to the Textual Talk Podcast. I'm your host, HD, and we're back with another episode of the Textual Talk Podcast. If you're listening to us on Apple or Spotify, please leave us a review and follow the podcast to help us out with the podcast analytics. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you know what to do. Subscribe, like, and hit that bell icon to be notified when we drop our content. Now, today's guest is our very first level, I mean, our very first CISO guest. And if you already tuned in, you see we are already talking about a lot of things that we kind of share in common when it comes to uh, mobile phones and OSs. But I want to introduce our guest to you right now, and his name is Gregory Richardson. Hey, Greg, how you doing? Fantastic. Thanks for the intro, Henri, um, aka HD. That's what we'll be calling you from now on, high def. Um, pleasure to be here, man. We've been connected for a minute now on, uh, on, you know, socials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm just glad to be able to come through here and talk. I've looked at a lot of your, um, other interviews, really, really compelling stuff and i honored that you would, um, ask me to join the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. All right. Let me get those levels. Good. Perfect. Perfect. But Guys, when I was trying to do a list of questions of his experience and, and I list them out, I said, you know what? There's so much, and we'll probably be in a five hour podcast. I'm going to let him introduce himself and then we'll just start talking about his experience because he has a lot of experience, guys. And for the people who are newer who are not in the field yet, and this either can go to mid level, senior level, and people who are on the cusp of being like directors, this is something that you're going to want to tune into so you can get all this free game. But Greg, can you just tell the audience uh, about yourself and a little bit, I guess, about your background? Sure. Um, I'm going to be very, very raw, kind of unfiltered. Um, background from a professional perspective. Fundamentally, I came into the cybersecurity industry. So this is my 39th, 38th, just under 40 years in the industry, working professionally. Um, I came into the industry fundamentally with a high school degree, nothing else. So I say the 40 years and the high school degree on purpose. I don't recommend anyone try that now. It's probably not your, I'm not saying you won't be successful, but it's probably a significantly longer path to get in and to get recognized and to you know, build credibility if you have no um, slightly higher levels of education. It worked for me because the, the industry was very infantile back in the beginning. So, you know, timing worked out. 
but for, that's 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 my history. I did go to college. I quit college um, because I quit college three and a half years into college um, because I wanted to work. And you know, I I I I, I literally told my parents, I, I want to work in this tech space. I'm tired of you know trying to learn about it. And I, you know, and I was stupid. I was young. I, I started college right around 16. Um, was always a little bit advanced with with with, with school and stuff. So I, I did well in school. So I, everything was early for me. So I started college at a very, very early age. It was my first time not living in my parents' home. My parents and I and everyone, my family, we all grew up in the Caribbean. So I was shipped to Tulsa, Oklahoma to college and, you know, 16 years old, something like that, about to turn 17. And this is the first time I am outside of my parents' home, 3,000 miles away from my parents. Um, I And I'm not the type of person to, quote unquote, while out. So I wasn't like partying at all. Um but I was very, very focused on, you know, I like this tech stuff. I like this computer stuff. I had a bulletin board system running in my, and for those who don't know, that's kind of a, kind of a loosely a precursor to stuff like the internet. I had one of those running in my dorm room. I was doing penetration testing. We'll call it that um, on, you know, anything that I could find online with a, tel- with a dial tone that was computer related. So I was actively learning that way. And I was less interested in learning via the books, via school. That's, you know, that's why I wanted to really work. I wanted to hands-on do ap- application of what I what I had learned and what I was learning. Um, so long story short, I quit college, went into the industry. My first year, I worked as a, probably a system admin, network admin, something like that. And that's pretty much the only year that I was not focused on cybersecurity. Very shortly, like, like I said, about within a year, I pivoted and I was like, I'm focused 100% on cybersecurity. Now, keep in mind, this is the 80s. So there's no internet yet. Um, So going to a business and saying, we can help you do cybersecurity was a very, 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 very tough sell. Because I literally have CEOs of companies and I went back home to the Caribbean. So I'd have the bosses of companies in the Caribbean say, why do I need to, what am I protecting my computer from? I'm like, you know, from theft and even steal your information. Like, what information? You know, money, checking account information, blah, 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 whatever. But there was no e-banking then. There was no, like, it, it was a different paradigm. So I had literally bosses of companies tell me, bro, if my accountant wants to steal money from me, he has the checkbook. Like, he doesn't need my computer. He has the paper checkbook. He could, you know, fake my signature, go to the bank, withdraw all the money and leave town. So I don't need computer security. I need, you know, maybe some kind of other security. So it was very bad industry to be in then, very tough to find work. You know, it wasn't the fancy, sexy, oh, cybersecurity, ethical hacker. It wasn't that at all. I stuck with it sheerly because of passion and I liked it. Uh, I'd love to say that, you know, I, I forced for new that, you know, in the future, this was going to, non- nonsense. I was stubborn. I liked it. It was something that I felt uh, God birthed inside of me. I, I felt it was my gifting. I, to a certain extent, I felt it was my calling that this is what you got to do, Greg. And it resonated inside of me. And that's why I did it. So long story short, you know, years later, um, Target gets hacked, Home Depot gets hacked, and then it pops off. And then at that point, that was probably 20 years into my career. So. I'd been giving out business cards at the Chamber of Commerce meetings and not getting leads, blah, 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 blah. When, you know, when the bad stuff started really popping off and Anonymous is out there hacking the bejesus out of the White House and everyone else they could get their hands on, suddenly now people are starting to look out. And I very quickly bubbled up to the top because you got how many years experience in this already? Yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years. Oh, come here. We need, we need, we need you to work with us. So that's how, you know, that, that's kind of the, the very condensed version of my background in the cyber industry. Um, so that's why it's difficult for you to look at. And my LinkedIn doesn't have, my LinkedIn probably has 25% of what I've done. Some of what I've done, I can't put publicly. Some of what I've done, I forgot. Some of what I've done is so old, the companies don't exist anymore, et cetera. A lot of what I've done is outside the U.S. also, especially the early parts of my years, because I didn't always live in the U.S., my family and I have lived here for maybe the last 20 years or so. Um, so, you know, I get why looking at, you know, my social profiles, to try to figure out what's his expertise is going to be tough 
because yeah, I've, I've, I've been doing this for a minute now, but it's really a, a, a passion project for me. And the other passion project for me is what we're doing now. I like sharing whatever information I have, hoping that it'll be of value to you and to your audience. Um, to, you know, if you want to get in, you want to come into the industry, you want to learn, you know, what works, what the, I, I'm honored to be able to share that um, because I can tell you this much. Cybersecurity industry is still one of the rare industries globally and in the North America and in, in the U.S. that has a negative unemployment rate. So there are millions of jobs out there needing to be filled that don't have humans that can fill them. It's rare. Most industries don't have that problem. So if I can help get more humans to, you know, be aware of their in, innate or internal passion for this that maybe they were not aware of. Yeah, I think we've done something good here. Last thing I'll say on this note, um, one of the things that I've, I've always found, and when I was younger, it, it again, luck, fortune, God, pick whatever you want to call it, worked in my favor in that I was always, I had a very high aptitude for math and science. Like from very young age, we realized that. I think I was in first, second, third grade when they were like, this dude, just give him, you know, analytics and science type classes and he'll be fine. And I liked it. But what I've, so when we started talking about computer science, they were like, yeah, but you got to have a math background. And then we started talking cybersecurity. Yeah, you got to have a math background. I had the math background. So it was very easy for me. Yep, that's me. And I just kept going forward. Um, now, though, I hear many people want to get in the industry or like the industry or probably have a passion about the industry within them. Um, but they're telling themselves, yeah, but I'm not good at science and math. So, you know, maybe this don't, this is a bad fit for me. I'm the one that's going to be here telling you, cut that nonsense immediately. Um, there are millions of roles available and many of them, I would say easily half of them are not the science and math roles. As a matter of fact, I think right now there's a bigger need in the industry of people who have potentially less science and math and analytics background and more EQ, emotional quotient background. Can you sit and have a real conversation with a CEO who's brilliant, who's a multi-billionaire, but is not a techie? Can you? That requires EQ. That does not require technical high levels of aptitude. So there's tons of roles where we need humans that can have human conversations about deeply technical subjects with people that might not be deeply, deeply technical. Yeah, thank you for that. And I like how you kept on emphasizing human. And I know why you're emphasizing that because I've watched, I think, one of your recent videos where you were talking about the AI boom and you know a lot of companies are saying oh, AI can do all this stuff without humans and all this stuff and you're like that's BS and so I like that you're emphasizing that human aspect of the work because that is in a in a shell because we got all these different tools that do all these cool things that are preventing all these threats but it's always the human aspect that's either going to make or break you when it comes to a breach almost every single time hundred percent correct. 100% correct. And that paradigm continues. I'm a very, very firm believer in humans were not genetically built for living in isolation, at least not for extended periods of time. I know there are unique exceptions where some people live in monasteries or monks and you know, there's other exceptions, but those are exceptions. For the most part, life is about humans interacting with humans. So um, the, the, I, and I apply that broadly across everything. I apply it to my marriage. I apply it to my life, businesses, uh, professional relationships, personal relationships. Um, I have switched jobs um, in the past because, you know, and went to smaller companies or taking cut and pay or whatever, whatever, because the humans at the place where I was going were better or, or connected with me better or were more loyal or had better culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, for those, you know, getting into the industry and thinking about career and that stuff, even outside of the cyber industry, focus, always remember to focus on the human aspect. You know, a phenomenal job where they're paying you, you know, seven figures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the humans are terrible to be around. It's not really a phenomenal job. 
I'm so glad that you said that coming from the level that you work at because one of my videos I made almost two years ago has actually been picking up some steam on YouTube. It's about a video I quit uh, at the time. A company I was working with, I just made a quick video. I saw it. I think it was the second I quit video. And um, people were mad at me because, you know, the amount of money I said I was making there. And it was like, I would have stayed and whatever. But I was like, you know, like you said, if the culture is not right and you are not happy, then it doesn't really matter. And like when I switched jobs, uh, my girl was like, I can really see like you're happier now. And that's the whole thing. Like I've made a comment on this show before about how when I was younger dealing with some adults, I always seemed like they had a bad attitude. And I said, mm -hmm. now I got older, I take three steps back. God. They really weren't mad at me. They probably were either mad at what they were doing in life or they didn't want to do in life. And they felt like they were stuck in it. And with my generation, we've been, been a generation of saying, hey, you know what? We are going to place our happiness above money so we can make sure we are good. Because if you're not good as a person, that just eats at you. You, yeah. you snap off quick, you're short with everybody, short with your kids, you're short with your wife. And it's just like, no, like you got to kind of find some type of balance. Like I'm not saying every day at the, the new company with the better culture is going to be good, but it'll be better than you dreading to go to work. Big facts, big facts. Now, I will, um, and I agree with you unequivocally. I will, though, sprinkle, I, I, I tend to try to be very countercultural often. I do think, and I'm going to limit my, the constraint of my conversation. Sorry if this is a little controversial. I do think in this- No school, I like controversy oh, well, you're going to love me. Uh, I do think in the Western Hemisphere, um, we have some culture issues. There's a lot of things that are culturally normal and culturally acceptable that I think are very yeah. flawed. Um, so here is one that I'm, I'm going to kind of slight. This is a minor one, but I'm push push back against the culture a little bit. I've recently been having this conversation. I have a 16 year. I have a couple of kids. I have multiple kids, not a couple, not two. And uh, I have a 16 year old daughter um, here in the house with me. School obviously just started back, et cetera. And she is, you know, don't want to pick on her too bad, but she is, you know, going through the stresses of, oh my God, school, I don't like school. You know, I don't like the, my class. I don't like, you know, these three kids that are in the class, the typical things that 16 year olders go through. And I, I had to sit her down and I had a conversation with her and I said, listen, I need you to understand something. From now till you die, you are going to have to do things that you don't like. Like, and I walked mm -hmm. her through life. I'm like, okay, so you're in school right now. Maybe you don't like your class. That might not be a justifiable reason for you to change schools. Because maybe there's long-term benefits to the school you're in that outweigh the benefits of, I don't, there's no cool kids around me. Fast forward to job. Yeah. Like we were just talking about with jobs. Sometimes you need to leave a job because the culture is bad. Other times... It might be life, God, whatever, stretching your capacity to teach you stay in this position because I need you to become better. I need you to improve in the areas where you have blind spots and or weaknesses right now. And th the people that are around you are going to call you out on you know, some of those blind spots and weaknesses so that you can yeah. get better. If you remember what I said a couple of minutes ago, I believe humans are built to not work in isolation. So that means sometimes there's going to be blind spots that, not sometimes, always in life, you're going to have blind spots. And it's going to require a human to come and tell you, bro, you don't even see this, but you're, you're, you're dropping the ball here. And when you hear that, that's not pleasant. And oftentimes our reaction right. to, I ain't like how we just tell me that. Your reaction might be to run and say, nah, I'm going around a bunch of people who will not tell me that. And sometimes you might miss the boat there. So while, yes, I, 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 I'm strongly an advocate of look for things for, in a job above and beyond title and salary and look for things that are, hey, is this a good environment? Is it non-toxic? Is it good culture? Good company, et cetera? You want to look for those things as well. But don't interpret that as I need to go where I'm happy. Sometimes yeah, there yeah. will be seasons, periods of time where you're not happy, but you need to stay in that spot to learn better. I remember in college, I was infinitely unhappy. And I said already, I dropped out of college. In hindsight, I look back and I was like, that was a mistake. 
I was being childish and stupid. I should have completed my college. And in my 40s, I went back and completed my college. It's ridiculous. Started college when I was 16. And in my 40s, 20 years later, I'm still talking about I got to get this college degree. The worst possible way. I, I should have just stayed and done it. But childishness, immaturity drove me to make poor decisions that I look back afterwards and realize eh, that wasn't the best thing. So sometimes you need to stick in a bad situation. Fast forward to job. Sometimes you're going to have a job. Not great. You don't feel great. You're not happy. But it might be where you need to be. Fast, and I told this to my daughter. I literally walked her through these, these, these chains. Say fast forward to retirement because maybe you think, yeah, I can't wait till I retire. Then, you know, I don't have a job. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm going to skip the retirement one. Fast forward to entrepreneurship. You know, the amount of people I've heard, I'm tired of working for the man, you know, or working for a boss. I'm going to be my own boss. All that means is you have a different boss now and it ain't you, fam. Your boss is now your customer. So if that customer calls yep. you at three in the morning, you ain't got no other paycheck coming in. That customer needs you at three in the morning. You're probably going to be there three in the morning. Yeah, but I didn't sleep last night. You're your own boss now. No one ain't cutting that W-2, that check every two weeks, dropping it in your account. You got to go out and go and hunt and find it. So you've now moved from job to entrepreneurship because you want to be your own boss and be happy. And you realize, oh my God, this ain't happy at all. This is a lot of pressure constantly. Right. Fast forward to retirement. Retirement, I ain't got no boss. I ain't got no job. I did good, you know, while I was working, I saved millions of dollars. So I, yeah, I could do whatever I want. And now your body starts failing. Your leg, my, mm -hmm. my dad is going through this right now in real time. He can't walk anymore. So he worked his whole life, saved, did everything right. Boom, boom, boom. Now he's in his eighties. He can't leave the house. He's literally trapped practically in his house because his legs don't work anymore. Someone's got to come pick him up. Someone's got to drive him to where he's going. Someone's got to walk him to the post office. So at every stage in life, there's going to be aspects of it that are you're not going to be happy about. That's right. No, I, I agree. Because I know like, um, like when I first tried to leave the help desk, I was trying to move to a different state. I was trying to move out here, but it wasn't time yet. It took a whole nother year. That I stayed there and I met some people that I was supposed exactly. to meet. Exactly. You know, that I, we are still friends now, we do different things with. And um, I think that's the reason I said that before. I said, you know, hey, if I would have left at this time, I would never met you. And then I would never did this. I would never did this. So you are right. We, that's why, even when I go back through some of the trials of that I went through at work, you know, leaving help desk or, or getting laid off or some of these other things that I've done, I always look at them like, you know, there was always a lesson learned, like you were talking about. Just getting back on culture just slightly a little bit is getting the wisdom now of being able to interview better, not in the sense to get the job, but being able to interview potential people you work with better versus the past mistakes you possibly made when you didn't ask the correct questions. Like vetting, if people go through dating or whatever, yeah. you're trying to figure out how to get your mate if they're the right fit for you. So going through those experiences that does help and play out in the right way. And like you were talking about, I told my friend this other day, we were on the phone. I would say sometimes people too are just only focusing on the money. They aren't looking at what the job that they take could possibly get them in two to three, five years. So you job top to another role that put you on the same level, but you didn't increase your knowledge any bit. Right. But this other person might have either stayed the company they were at or went somewhere else, but it was a it wasn't paying the best, but they had greater responsibility. Now in those three years, they make double or triple what you make. And a lot of people are short sighted and not far sighted like that because they're only just thinking about the money. I was like, hey, well, if you always have the skill sets, like you said, because I worked at Target when that when that breach happened, I was actually a team member at Target. But like you said, you were in position because you had already been doing it for twenty years, and now you're you're at the top. Yep. And so hopefully that countercultural things that we, I, 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 I strongly encourage anyone that's trying to, you know, grow and, and improve. And, and, and I don't mean grow and improve financially only, um, but I mean, just generally, yeah. I'm trying to be better, trying to grow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, trying to have better marriages, better relationships, better friends, better spiritual life, better, all of that. Um, you push back into culture. There's something in our culture now that says everything I'm doing is for now. I need this satisfaction right now. 
I need instant gratification right now. I need the career that pays me a million dollars a year right now. I need to be recognized as the best in my field right now. And a lot of things in life are not instantaneous like that. You know, we like to look back at the the Jeff Bezos story and, you know, uh, started off as selling books and, you know, now he's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And we, 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 we interpolate it in our mind. Like you see, it happened to him. It could have, it, it might've take, taken him 20 years. You don't know what he went through before the first iteration of starting Amazon. Um, like how many terrible jobs he had, how many bosses he had that yelled at him, that taught him something that made him into the decision maker that he is today that allows him to run a business and, and to innovate and, and start a business, you know, that, that, ha that has the kind of reach that Amazon has now. I, I often um, um, think about Amazon because I'm old enough to remember when Amazon was a bookseller. That's all they sold. Now Amazon is AI, mm -hmm. they're AWS. Most companies now like that are not books, like just random companies are hosting their sites and their servers at Amazon and the AWS cloud store. Like they're pervasive, not to mention you buy groceries from them. You buy, you know, knickknacks and the phones and phone cases from them. They're doing same day. Like they have expanded way Music, past where they video. started. You exactly. You got Prime Video. Your TV. You turn it on. Amazon's there looking at you. Hey, here's a new movie you want to see. Like it's amazing how far they have grown. All off of you know some guys, you know whatever crackhead scheme. Kudos to yeah. them. But you don't. You see the success and you see where they are today. You don't see what it took to get someone to think like that. I often um tell uh, I, I mentor one or two people. I I, I keep that group very very mm -hmm. small. Um, have to because I have a finite amount of time and my family and my, my, exactly. my spiritual life is more important than everything else. So they come first. And then after that, you know, work. And if I have some time, I'll mentor. So I mentor a couple of people and I was telling one of them, you got to understand, um, I think it's, the term is not, I think the term is the dark triad and it's three parts of your, your, the human mind. I can't remember what they are. Narcissism was one of them. I can't remember the other two psychosis and something else, whatever. But it, it, it's the dark parts of your mind that, you know, that makes a person into a serial killer, so to speak. They think they're the most important thing. They think everyone else has no value. And they think human life, eh, if I got to kill that person, I got to kill that person. That's a, a psycho. That's someone that, you know, will, you know, shoot people on crazy or whatever have you. But the most successful politicians, business leaders, etc., have all been tested and it's it, it's been proven through studies that they are very high on that dark triad as well for you to be a politician and you go out and tell you know your entire city your entire town your entire county i can solve all of these problems you should vote for me that requires a certain level of psychosis and narcissism that is not normal everyone doesn't think that everyone doesn't walk through the world and see a problem and say you know what i could fix that most people don't Entrepreneurship is the same thing. For you to think you're walking down the street, you see a pothole, you know, I could fix that by building an app. You're, you're high on that dark triad. Why? Who the heck is you that you think you can fix that? So you, you, you got to be very aware of that and you have to balance that and manage it carefully that you're never giving in too much as an entrepreneur, as, you know, a, a, a leader um, into the dark side of your triad. You have to manage it. You have to like be self-aware. And in my case, and I recommend this to everyone, you got to have people around you, mentors that have, and I got to comment on mentors. Don't, I don't believe in a hundred mentors. You should have one or two mentors, probably two tops. I have a emotional health mentor Basically, my, my therapist, not basically, I pay him. He's a therapist. I go to therapy once a month to sit with him, pay him. He, he makes sure my soul is right. He makes sure Greg internally, heart, emotions, is, he makes sure that's all aligned. He'll tell me. Last time I walked into a session about a month ago, walked in, sat down. He says, I can see in your face. You need to rest. We're going to start taking it easy. You're going to start saying no to stuff. I can't question him. Well, I choose not to question him. I got it. I'm going to start saying no to more things. But I also have a business and spiritual mentor. He could call me out on anything. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I mentioned the car rental. One point, my car rental was growing really fast, was adding cars, was up to like 40, 50 cars, whatever. He saw the growth and he literally called, Greg, you, you adding cars? Yep. Just bought five more cars, just bought 10 more cars. We're doing great. He literally told me, I don't give you permission. He don't own none of my, my shares. He's not a, a, a financial partner. He's my mentor. He literally told me, stop buying cars. I'm telling you right now, you're not allowed to buy no more cars. Put structures in place. You're going to hire an admin. You're going to hire three, three drivers. You're going to hire mechanics. You're going to do this because you're going to kill yourself, working yourself to death. Even though it's profitable, if you don't structure it and put process in place, you're not going to be able to scale properly. Do that before you buy another car. And if I see you buy another car, it's going to be me and you. You know what I did? Called, <laughs> stop buying cars. And I hired people, put people, put processes in place, wrote out standard operating procedures, trained everyone, and then we grew, and then the business um, grew and scaled properly. I believe in mentors, but don't obscure good mentorship by having 20 mentors. Because I've seen that in entrepreneurs as well, where you have one mentor that knows the financial details. You have one mentor that knows how your marriage is doing. You have one mentor that knows the business details, the business decisions you make. You have one mentor that's spiritual, but the spiritual one don't know the financial. So the spirit, you can go to the spiritual one and say, listen, I need prayer because I'm, I'm nervous about something. The financial <laughs> one knows you're nervous about something because you just went to the casino and, and spent out all your money. The prayer one don't know that you just did that. So you, you are effectively hiding the truth because you have so many mentors. That's why I believe in mentors, get mentors, keep those mentor groups very small. But that mentorship, back to the dark triad, allows someone to have visibility into, hey, Greg, Greg, you're, you're skewing the wrong way right now. Cut it. And you, you need to have that in place. Again, we started this at the beginning of the conversation. Humans are not built for working in isolation. So the minute I isolate myself, the minute is when I open up myself for the worst tendencies in me to come out. So very, very, very important. Yeah. And none of this is central to cybersecurity. Nah. But, but it's part of the human. It's part of the human. And the if you want to be in this cybersecurity industry, I, I can't warn you enough. There's lots of things. I love this industry. It's pretty much the only industry I've worked in. There's lots of things that are very, very, very bad in this industry. I've never been to parties with um, serving platters full of cocaine until I came into the cybersecurity industry. A couple of years back, DEF CON, Black Hat, et cetera, in Las Vegas, when I said a couple of years back, say 10, 15 years back, that was the most normal thing. You go to a party, um, the hookers are there, um, the drinks are here, the bar is there, and the cocaine table is there. Like that, when you walk in, that's how they introduce the party to you. So I'm not a party guy, so and, I, I, and I'm not qualming anyone who says they're a party person, but if you're weak right. and you can't handle that, this ain't the industry for you. That's died down quite a bit, but there's still some really negative things. And you've seen one of them blow up in real time right now. Uh, last week, yeah, it was last week in Las Vegas, there was Black Hat. Black Hat is one of Black Hat and DEF CON. Very, very, very large, probably 20, 13, 14, 15, 20 years going now, cybersecurity conferences. Um, this, they often jokingly call it um, Summer camp for nerds, because always in the summer, it's always in Las Vegas. It's one of them's over the weekend, one of them's three, four days before the weekend. And, you know, all everyone comes and you see people that you haven't seen because they don't work with you no more in the same company, but they're still in the industry. So it's, it's, it's a good place to reconnect. I've been going. I always go. Um, this year, and I'm not going to call any company names, this year, one company um, decided they're going to take women, humans and put lampshades over their heads. And I know you're going to get to And me. these will be the, gre and like they had on like sexy evening gown dresses with their legs out, blah, 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 whatever. And this was their greeters. Now on pictures mm -hmm. leaked and they, they weren't private. This was like at a VIP party or whatever, whatever. But that was the greeters, real human women with lampshades over their head, with logos on the lampshades so you couldn't see their faces. Like me even describing that to you should sound comically stupid. Like, who would think that's a good idea? Like, objectively, really, is that a good idea? It's obviously a terrible idea. You know why that would float in the cybersecurity industry? Many reasons. But one of the reasons is ego. 
Ego is a real problem in this industry. Everyone I thinks they're the that. smartest. Everyone thinks they're the... And if you don't have good people around you to call you out and say, bro, you're giving into your ego a little bit. You got too many people around you on that job telling you the greatest thing ever walking. And you come home now and you think you can do the greatest thing ever walking. I got my wife that'll call me out on that and say, Come, take about five notches down, little boy. I knew you when you was living in a car, literally. My wife met me <laughs> when I was homeless, living in a pickup truck. The pickup truck wasn't even mine. The pickup truck belonged to the company <laughs> that I was doing security work for. They let me drive the pickup truck. I was living in the pickup truck when she met me. So many times she'll have to call me out and say, eh, calm down. You're doing all right. But we keep, let's keep it a buck. We know where you come from. So um, you need that, that, that human basis around you, keep you grounded, especially in this cybersecurity industry, um, because there, there's, there's lots of negative. And I can't underscore enough the ego. Lots of egos here. And that egos, if it's at the high level in the, in the company, it'll lead to a very toxic culture. So there's lots of companies out here that great companies doing financially well. Great technology, but awful, toxic culture because of egos up way high up at the top of it. So you need people around you to keep call you out on that. I would, whatever infinity number, I can start from 100 to a million to, you know, 10 billion, whatever. I, I, I totally agree. I think I've seen that now. I've only been in a third of your career span right now. So like, you know, 10, 11 years, but I've seen it myself. Like you said, we talk about different environments, different companies, different cultures. Uh, you start to see certain archetypes of people being hired in certain places. And, and so th this is one of the things that you'll, you kind of will realize is like, Hey, if, you know, if I have currently seen in this current company now that unless the vision, the strategy change from up top and the buy-in of how they do things change for the culture, yeah then you won't be able to promote because of like, you know, some places, hey, they want you to kiss up. They want you to do this. They want you to do that. And if that's not you, you want to say, hey, I only want to be promoted based on what I contribute and the merits of my work. Then that may be a place where you may just find yourself not getting to where you kind of want to go. You could do all the visibility things and everything, but sometimes people don't like a person that's going to say, hey, no, we shouldn't do that. Or this doesn't make sense or this or that. Like you, you are sometimes as looked at as a, I won't say a problem, but maybe they'll probably look at you as maybe it's difficult, but you're using common sense. And that's what I feel like cybersecurity misses a lot of common sense. It's always people want to be smarter than what it takes to actually get the job done. Like people are forgetting the kiss method yep. of Keep things. Like, so I'm gonna think, I've said plenty of times, LinkedIn has this thing, I'm pretty sure you probably contributed to it before, so you can be like a top security voice and they'll ask you a question. They asked me about uh, SOAR, and I, and I plainly said, hey, a lot of companies don't need SOAR. They need to at least even get their SIM structure just tuned and manageable before they jump in, or you're still going to be dealing with garbage. You're wasting all this money so you can go tell this potential client, yeah, we got Phantom, we got XOR, we got whatever uh, other tools out there. You know, Come on, we'll help you out. Meanwhile, your analysts or your IR people and all these other people that work on this stuff, it's like... This is garbage. The money you guys are spending on this SOAR platform could go back into the payroll and get some people that can actually make some changes. Yep. Like those are the things people don't do. They would rather just say they have the latest and greatest, but it doesn't work. <laughs> it's like buying a, a Rolls Royce, but it's broke. Like you bought a, a used Rolls Royce with a bad motor. It doesn't work. But you told somebody, hey, I got a Rolls you Royce in, it up the, outside, in the driveway. You put pictures on social media. There's me and my Rolls. It can't move. Tra ain't got no transmission. Mm -hmm. But it's shiny and it's outside my house though, and it's on my exactly. social media. Yay! And it's that's not new. A lot of people will blame our culture today and say, you know, the social media culture. We did that. So I obviously grew up before social media was a thing. We did that before social media. You know, you'd come to school and you'd yep. be fronting, and you're actually used your friend's shoes because he had a pair of Jordans you liked, and you put them on. And see, I got the Jordans, and oh my God, he, for real, it's on his foot. He's got yep. ain't even his Jordans. He broke. He ain't got no food. He eating, you know, Chef Boyardee um, beefaroni every day for dinner because he and his whole family yep. broke. But he fronting like he got like that's that, that we've been doing that because that's what humans do. Humans inclined towards, especially in this Western culture, 
I got to outdo, you know, everyone else. I have to, you know, publicly, and again, in conversation with my 16 year old, calm down on the, you know, sharing everything because everyone needs to know you just went to the store and here's a haul. Forget the privacy concerns because from a cybersecurity perspective, there's real privacy concerns with that. But there's also the, you're, you're measuring yourself by an incorrect standard because what you're posting ain't mm-hmm. real because you're a little girl and you ain't got no job. So you taking a, a, a haul from, you know, some, you ain't got no money. You, you using someone else's money. And you comparing yourself to some friend who might be lying. Like, it's, it's definitely ain't yeah. her money. So, you know. They put the stuff on and they ain't took right, it Right, exactly. Uh, that, I, I recently heard about that. Um, a, a friend of mine works at one of the big department stores, Neiman's, Nordstrom, one of them. I can't remember. It starts with an N. And they said that's the whole thing. People will come in, credit card, buy $10,000 worth of gear and bring it all back. And I'm like, well, what's the point of that? Do you, do you do wear it? Nope. They just take pictures of it and go online and go on their social media followers and say, yeah, you know, do, call. This is the stuff I got. And, and they bring it back. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is nonsensical. I ain't got the time to want to do that. But this is, this is the society we find ourselves in now. So all of that loops to have trustworthy, one or two trustworthy mentors around you that can call you out when you slip it up. So I mentioned earlier, this is an example of real life, what I need to do. One of my um, 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 things that I need to constantly keep a measure on is self-control. I, 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 I can lose my temper easily. And I'm, not, I'm not a murderer. I've never shot anyone, killed anyone. I've never, never really been a fighter. I'm very much a nerd. But I'll lose my temper, and my, that means I talk rough. I'll, I'll raise my voice, be very aggressive. <laughs> and that don't always rock well. Don't rock well with employees. Don't rock well with customers. Definitely don't rock well in your household, with your family, et cetera. So it's something that I constantly have to call out. So fast forward to whatever, a couple of years back traveling. I said uh, several times now, I travel a lot for work and for business. It, that's, that's normal. It's been this situation for about 20 years. So on one of my weekly trips, I'm somewhere at an airport and you know how airports are. Walk up to the airline counter. Hey, yeah, I'm here to check in. And the lady at the counter, you know, yells at you or she's excessive, lady, man, whatever. The person is excessively harsh. My normal reaction is, you're going to be rude to me. Well, we about to have it on. So now I'm going to talk even louder than you and even ruder than you because you started off being rude to me. My wife and some other people t- said, hey, why do you need to react like that? You don't know what that person's been through. Sure, they're 100% wrong. They shouldn't have done that. But are you helping the matter? Did you resolve anything? Or can you give them a little bit of grace and say, maybe she had bad, he or she had a bad life, a bad situation. Just, you know, a kid just got sick. A kid just died. Husband just lost it. You don't know. So for the sake of consideration to the other humans around you, Sometimes you got to, often you got to quench your gut reaction. And again, I'm I'm purposefully coming back to it. You need mentors that can call you out on that immediately as soon as they see it happening. You're getting too edgy, Greg. You're you're, you're getting too sharp, Greg. Your your words, your your wit, your your smart aleckiness, cut it before it becomes a problem. Gotcha. Will do. Thank you. Appreciate the feedback. No, you're right. So, and like, honestly, I feel like all this could be his own separate show because it's so good because there's just things that people really need to know. Because I I think so much we focus on so much technical things, which I agree, you know, there are technical aspects of the job, but just in life, being a good person, I always say companies most of the time want to hire good people, people that they would want to be around. And so that's when it comes into the interview and uh, what you're doing is selling yourself. So at least selling the best version of yourself to hopefully that you get the offer, you come on to the company. But I actually, you said something interesting in the beginning. You were talking about cybersecurity, humans, and uh, the millions of jobs, right? I kind of want to give you just a smidge of a pushback on that. Well, not really you per se. I, th- I think it's the industry. Well, for Because I did an episode on this before. Like I kind of reviewed like, all the cybersecurity jobs, they say they're out here from the site called cyberseek.org. And I saw that while that there were cybersecurity jobs on there, but there are also other jobs that had cybersecurity aspects of it that, you know, they were putting all in this bucket. But I think the real crux of the argument is that 
you have all these people, and I think you've seen it probably from a higher level, but since like the last three, four years, cybersecurity has become even more popular. And based off of like those terms, zero uh, percent unemployment, millions of jobs, everybody's you know went on the boom. Even though know, you people probably consider somebody like myself an influencer, I don't really don't consider myself an influencer, but they'll say like you know you're pushing for people to get into cybersecurity. So you have some a lot of people that are trying to put in the work, trying to get into cybersecurity, but the disconnect comes from the companies of saying, hey, well, we don't like that experience that you got on your own. So now the people, some of them are in the conundrum of like, hey, I want to get in, but I don't have experience. So why, you know, or people tell me, hey, well, these jobs are unfulfilled. All you have to do is this, this, and this, but yet a company will not give me a shot. And I try to loop that back into either the ego and then some like the gatekeeping stuff that we see to where certain people are not getting a chance. And you know this, being at the top, I've gotten places in our workplace. I said, the only way these people got this job here was like because they were just here at an earlier time, but they weren't better. Because that's what I've seen. It's like a lot of us are not directors or C level yet, just because we weren't, we just weren't ready at the time. But the other people are not inherently better than us. Some people are good at it, some aren't. They just happen to have worked at enough C level jobs that somebody will bring them in just because, okay, they got experience of being C level. But that's the change I'm saying. Like, you can't coach the people who are actually wanting to get better on their own. Like, they're not getting paid to do this training or nothing. They are at home. They are labbing. They are reading up on security threats. They're trying to understand things like we talked about uh, briefly, which we'll probably get into probably after this conversation with the crowd strike, uh, blue screen of death. They're trying to understand all these things so they can just get some type of entry level role or some role. And just for recruiters or or people to sometimes just interview them, knowing who they're going to hire. It's like, I think that's like a whole mess in itself, but I think that's one of the things the industry should like change. It should be more welcoming. If you say you have all these jobs and you want these people to, to come in, I think it's time to start treating cybersecurity like a skilled trade versus however they're trying to teach it right now. Because if you want to be like a, a plumber or do HVAC or a carpenter or something like that, there, there's not... You go do your schooling and you, I think you do like an apprenticeship or something under somebody and then you get jobs. It's not as hard as how they make you go through this optical course to get in cybersecurity. Yeah. You said a lot of things there. I'm going a, I'm to a try to answer bits and pieces of them. And I definitely want to come back to that, that um, analogy you just pulled with, you know, a plumber or HVAC or electrical or mechanic. You, you take, do some courses, you learn the practical, tactical things that, hey, these are best practices. This is what you should do. Then you work under someone and then you get in. Done. Case closed. I like that an analogy and I'm going to correlate that to cybersecurity here in a minute. But regardless to everything you said, there are still obviously jobs there. Like we can go and find them and find them listed. And even if you down select and filter out jobs that have, as you described it, a cybersecurity component, but they're not really cybersecurity jobs. You know, someone needs a network admin and you should also know a little bit about firewalls because you're going to have to interact with, you know, the security team. It's not a cybersecurity job. This is a network admin job, but I get it. And even if you down select and take all of those out, you might drop it from millions of jobs to hundreds of thousands of jobs, which is too much. You might drop it from 3 million jobs to 2 million jobs or 1 million jobs. You're not going to cut the amount of jobs down by 90%. So bottom line remains, there are definitely Jobs available in cybersecurity, full stop. Back now to the, the middle point you were saying where, but it's very difficult to get into cybersecurity and you know, it, it, there's a lot of gatekeeping and weird stuff with recruiters, et cetera. I agree with you a thousand percent. Thousand total, 100%, I agree with you. And that is a problem. That does not negate that there are jobs available. As a matter of fact, I must suggest to you, that's probably why so many of the jobs are available. All of those jobs are not just available because they can't find humans. A lot of those jobs are available because recruiting does, uh, and I'm not picking on recruiters, but the recruiting process has flaws. So there's people that they could have hired years ago to fill a lot of those jobs, but because the recruiting process is screwed up, they never even, excuse me, they never even see the right people. So that's a second thing we got. We got so be more accurate with the, the down selection of what are actually cybersecurity jobs, which will probably decrease the count a little bit, but it's not going to make it zero. We need to fix the issues in recruiting. And then 
this ties into it back to the analogy of the plumber and you know you you get you get some you get a trade you learn it you mentor with someone you work with someone and then you get in that paradigm fundamentally holds in cybersecurity and the people that i've mentored and now have very successful jobs in companies making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and many of them also like me at the time came in with little formal education, um, the reason they got in was because they did that second step. You get your training, you learn your stuff, you do your stuff in your lab, like you were saying, Henri, HD, sorry. Um, and then you work with someone else that's above you, like the plumber, like the mechanic, like the HVAC person. You don't get into those fields just working all willy-nilly and you, know, you pop up and, hey, I'm the best mechanic ever. No one going to take you seriously. I'll give you a good example. Just this week, I brought in a plumber to come to my house and check, do some minor things with leaks of this and that and the other. The guy was here two, three days ago. He shows up with three people. Dude, I'm talking about minor things. Check a faucet, check a flapper on a toilet, and check a, a pipe outside that's running. Like my, I'm like, why you throw up with three people? That guy is my supervisor. He's monitoring me. This guy is my mentor. My mentee, sorry, I am training him. And I literally watched dude stand up outside my house with a, a, a phone thing, a walkie-talkie, tell the dude, go inside, go to this thing, show me on video, turn it off, turn it on, boom, do so. And he's, he's literally doing nothing. He's just mentoring that guy. So it still happens in plumbing. We need to be more maniacal and more purposeful, more intentional about doing that in cyber. But a lot of us want to skip that mentorship step. And they want to, I studied it. I got it. I did the labs on my own. You should now give me the job. I don't think that's feasible. And happen so, what works around, and I'm not suggesting that we leave the recruiting process flawed like it is. It's a different conversation. We do need to fix that. But while the recruiting process is a little jacked up, what does work around? The flaws and the issues in our recruiting process is having a good mentor. Because when I reach out to the HR person or the hiring manager at a company that I have a relationship with, and I say, hey, you know me, right? Greg, we've met, we've worked together. Yeah, amazing. How you doing, bro? I got a candidate for you. I need you to, <coughs> excuse me, I need you to give him an interview right away. Yeah. Wh who is it? That's uh, unequivocally, that's the reaction I get. That guy, that candidate, I've I, numerous times I've had the candidate send in a resume, fill in the LinkedIn job thing, gets no response back. He reaches back out, Greg. We have a relationship. We've been working together. And don't call me or hit me up on LinkedIn and say, hey, we don't know each other. Well, don't say this. Don't call me, hit me up on LinkedIn. We have no relationship. I have no, I can't refer you because I don't know who the heck you are and ask me to refer you. But that's not the way referrals work. But once we've had a relationship and I, I could vouch for you, like I could legit tell someone, HD is a good man. This, he's done this. He's done this. I've seen him do this. Like I, this ain't no pretense. When I can make that phone call and tell the hiring manager, listen, I strongly recommend HD. I know what you're looking for. I know what HD can do. He's the guy right there. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get an immediate at bat meaning you're going to get an immediate interview. And now you've now gone, you've solved all of the recruiting, gatekeeping. You've solved all of that because now you're talking to the recruiter. Now you're talking to the hiring manager. And now it's up to you to be good at interviews and good at EQ to be able to convey a technical message to this hiring manager so that they can, yeah, HD really showed me that he could do this job. That's how people get into the industry. So we need to go back in cybersecurity to a, a, a paradigm of find a, someone that can mentor you, have them mentor you, build a legit relationship with them, and that's the way you get into the industry. Because there are too many people right now, and this is, it seems, you know, conflict. There's lots of job open, but there's lots of people. There's probably hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. right now, I'm about to get into cyber. Half of them probably shouldn't want to be in cyber. It's not what they should do. So what happens when a company like a Palo Alto Networks, like a BlackBerry, like a CrowdStrike, like a Microsoft, when they put a role out there, hey, we're hiring. You know what happens? They literally get 15,000 applications. 
Yes. I promise you, in 15,000 yeah. applications, you're going to lose 10,000 of the most qualified people because n- you can't filter through that effectively. When a mentor calls and says, hey, I know you got 15,000 applications. I'm telling you, HD is one. Suddenly now HD comes out of the 15,000 and he's one of the five people that are down selected. That's how mentorship helps. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. Because I mean, like you said, in two places, you have mentorship and then coaching. Like, so what I do with the coaching is there are people that have went out and got all these different skills, whatever, but they do not know how to bridge the gap yep. to get the interviews. I've been applying everywhere on my resume. So a lot of times with me, it starts off <clears throat> bad resume, no network, bad LinkedIn, bad approach to recruiters, di- directors, people on the team. And so these are simple things we go through. And then if, for some of my clients, some of my clients show me instantly when we talk, they're putting in the work. I don't have to really ask what they're doing. Those are the ones that I go above and right. beyond for to use more connections at different places to get them a job. One of my recent clients now uh, is doing his first IR stay at Yahoo. I know my listeners are like, man, he can talk about this guy about four or five weeks straight. But because I saw him put in the work over a year's time period and the fact that preparing him for the interview process and they Back. told him, you know, verbatim, you, they told him verbatim, you outperform your resume. That was really, that's probably one of the biggest achievements I've got because it's, that's one of the things is like, I do want to help you guys if you're going to do blue team soccer, or IR, help you really understand the totality of what you're doing. Because when you learn your courses, you kind of learn a lot of stuff in the silo. And then, so you have to understand sometimes like how the business makes money and what does this mean on a, on a wide scale when you're kind of interpreting these different things when you're working? Because, yeah, you're having like some mock-up data, but it's nothing like the real thing. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't show you about timing efficiency or using other resources that are at your disposal when you're in a real environment on how to get the answers you need. And that's where I come in because I've got experience doing that. And then on the flip side... You're right when you talk about having just a, a mentor. Like, and I tell a lot of people too, because I hate this, and you probably have ran into this a lot. I have people I've probably never spoken to. Um, we've ne- probably never said anything. They never probably come in on a video, come in on a post. They just reach out to me, nothing. Hey, uh, uh, can you be my mentor? This and I was like, well, I don't know you. To me, mentorship kind of starts out a lot, kind of like, um, like not formal relationship. Like, it, it, I, I talk yeah. for a while, yeah, and I say, you know, I'll be, I'll be your mentor. One of the the guys, this is I think that's four years ago when Dayspring reached out to me, and um, you can see that his career is where he is now because of mentorship. To where he did skip some lines. He once he got his first soccer job, it was paying him low. I said, just take it, let's get the experience. When I got some on my team, I'll help you get on, and that happened. And he got on there, excelled there, went on from there, went to Datadog, and now is uh, working for Amazon. And so, like you said, you will have fast trick fast track success if you have the right people in your right. life, the right mentors that can show you, hey, do this, learn this. Oh, this is how you, you know, conduct some things in an interview or how you become more visible to kind of be your best advocate in the company. Because a lot of people are doing a lot of good work, but nobody knows they're doing it because they're not advocating for themselves. Yep. And then people know, like, hey, your manager may say, like, okay, I know you want to do this, but you're going to have to be the person that looks out for your career because you're the only person that's going to benefit off of it the most the managers i mean you make them look better but they sometimes all managers will not be going to bat for you so you got to do it for yourself yeah and that's one of the the <clears throat> that's a very good um example to highlight one of the issues we spoke about earlier partic- and this is not unique to the cybersecurity industry but we both work in cyber right. so hence we're, we're talking about it from that perspective but that actually is what feeds egos in our industry as much as it does. Um, again, mm-hmm. being a nerd, being you know very tech savvy, it's probably going to be difficult for most of your audience to believe this, but I'm very introverted. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I was never in my life the, hey, let's go out to a bar and hang out guy. Too many people in a bar, um, that, ain't, that ain't me. I would, if you look over my shoulder, there's a Commodore 64 back there. That's where I spent my, my youth growing up, in my living room, in the, on the family TV, with the Commodore 64 or an Atari 800 and a cassette tape with Byte Magazine typing in, because there was no internet, so you get a, the new game, 
You open up Byte Magazine and it's lines of code. And you type in those lines of code. That's how I learned coding. That's how I learned about computers. That's how I learned about gaming. That's how I got into gaming. That's how I got games to play. You type one letter wrong. It doesn't work. You had a syntax error. You got to go back and troubleshoot it. Where did I go wrong? So you're learning coding. You're learning a lot of things. You're learning accuracy. But I always rather do that than go out around people. So not being super extroverted and not being one that likes to talk about, hey, look at me. I did so and so and so and so. I was never like that. When I got into the cyber industry, mm -hmm. I've realized what you just said, Henry. If you don't talk about the successes you did, oftentimes ain't no most managers are not going to talk about your successes. And I'm going to call a name purposeful. I worked for one manager, probably one of the best managers I've ever worked for in my life. His name is Mike Chaffee, still in the cybersecurity industry to this day. He hired me years ago. It's probably at this point, 10, 15 years ago. I don't remember exactly when. He said, very quickly, Greg, someone recommended you. Don't worry about who. I need, I need to give you an interview. And he spoke. And he was like, I, I want to hire you. You seem like a good dude. When I started working for him, he was the one who highlighted Greg's successes. But he also pulled me aside and says, Greg, you need to get better at making sure the people that you've served and you've helped understand that you've helped them. Because I'm a good manager. I am talking about you to my leaders. But you're, one of these days, you're going to have a manager that doesn't do that. So it triggers that I got to talk about myself now. And what does that trigger? That feeds into your ego. So it very quickly mm -hmm. moves from, I'm talking about myself because that's good for career. And it can, it's, it's a thin line, remember that dark triad thing. It's a thin line between yeah. I'm doing this for my career to I'm doing this because I'm a cocky son of a gun. And I just want everybody mm -hmm. to know, you know what I did? I'm the baddest, I'm the so-and-so yeah. and so-and-so. And now you're no longer doing it for your career. Now you're doing it for, because you cocky, you arrogant. And you got too much ego. Right. So there's a balance there. But again, in life, like everything else, we balance, we manage the tension that, am I going too far? Am I going, you know, am I not doing it enough? But you're spot on. You absolutely need to, it's a, it's a technique. It's a, it's, you practice to how do I talk about myself and make sure it's clear that I have been executing accurately and well and efficiently and been doing a good job. That's a component of good career growth as well. It's a, you know, right. it's a sad yeah. component to a certain extent, but it's, it's fact. <laughs> so what happens in that type of environment? The narcissists that think they're the greatest at everything, even though they're not, they oftentimes are the ones that get promoted. Because they've been out there talking about themselves from day one. They've been out there saying stuff like, I'm going to fake it till I make it. I don't know nothing about this tech stuff, but I'm going to talk like I do. I'm going to use terms like AI, ML, and, and, <laughs> and you know, Gen AI. I, don't, I can't spell AI, but I'm going to talk about AI. And, you know, boom, next thing you hear, oh, he's the VP of AI over at so-and-so-and-so, but he don't know nothing. Um, yeah, and it has to do with the fact that He's good at, that person is good at talking about themselves. This video is being sponsored by Textual Consulting. Are you still struggling to get into cybersecurity? Are you not getting interviews? Do you have a bad resume? Or is it all the above? Well, if that's you, then we got you covered at Textual Consulting. My name is Henri Davis. I'm a career coach and a cybersecurity professional, and I've helped hundreds, maybe even thousands of people get into cybersecurity with my coaching and my content that you've seen in various places. Now, I specialize in specifically getting people in the blue team. That would be incident response or SOC analysts. I can cover everything from your entry level to your medium to your advanced skills and really help you outperform your resume. You don't believe me? Check out some of these testimonials that I've had from recent clients. So if you're interested, click the link in my bio TextualConsulting.com forward slash offerings to see what offerings that we have available for you. Now, back to the show. I agree. I was trying to find, I don't, <laughs> you're probably going to laugh when everybody, I know you hear the young people talk about TikTok and stuff like that, but it was a, it was a TikTok and the guy was explaining how like, just because, you know, you talk a lot or something in the meeting, like they'll try to make you start being like a leader, but doesn't mean you're going to actually be a good Facts. leader. And you do see that a lot. I was surprised. And that was one of the ways how I like kind of fast tracked in one of my companies 
people would get on the call and not say anything. So I'm the only person in the handoff or these other quarterly calls answering a lot of the questions. So it, I mean, of course I was good at what I do, but it makes it seem like I am the best because I'm the only person talking to where my manager at the time said, hey, you know, everybody except Henri, please like talk or answer some things. But I was shocked when I found out, like you said, a lot of people will go through life and just kind of just work. They're not doing, oh, I can go solve this or that. So I was surprised when I found a lot of grown people are not that active, you know, on the call or whatever. They're pretty much just, hey, let's get it over so I can finish doing what I'm doing so I can go exactly. home. So you're totally right in that regard when you bring that up. Let I mean, me give you another example of where I see this. And I, I kind of find it funny. And this is, again, not picking on, but just it's where I live. So that's what I could talk about the cybersecurity industry, go to cyber, smaller cyber conferences where they have open mic and they say, okay, we're going to have a panel discussion and then we allow people to come up to the microphone from the audience and ask questions. In the cyber industry is one of the places where you see that, that ego and that narcissism come out the most. The amount of questions that people will come up to the mic because of what you just said, they like to talk in meetings. They like to be the one talking the most. So in a public meeting that's not a Zoom call, you give them a microphone, they're coming up. They got to say something because in their, their ego, they got to let the whole room know, oh my God, look how smart he is. Look at the question he asked. So what does that digress into? That devolves into people coming up asking questions that are not questions at all. They literally just came up <laughs> to the mic because they wanted you to hear, FYI, I'm in the room. I've had people come up. I'm on a panel. I'm up there. Hey, any questions? We just spoke. Uh, we spent an hour talking about ransomware. Someone comes up. Yeah. Hi, my name is Bob. And I just want you to know I've got, you know, 100,000 years in the industry. And, you know, I built these three apps and, you know, I work for so-and-so and now I started my own. Dude, what's the question, fam? <laughs> but yeah, that's one of the things you yeah. see in this industry a lot because ego is so prevalent in it. So that's one of the things I've had to balance in myself as well. Like, when are you talking because you have something to say? Versus you're talking because you you want to be type A personality and make sure everybody understands that you're in the room. So it's it's a balance. It's a yeah. constant balance. Yeah. Like I said, a lot like you said, a lot of people do not focus on EQ, soft skills. And ironically, I was in an interview a couple of days ago. And I actually that was one of the things they asked me about how would I give like an endless feedback or something. And I actually brought up EQ. I try to bring up EQ in like a lot of different interviews just because I know it's something that everyone doesn't know about. I took a class on EQ, but it actually, the things I learned in the class helped me to be, uh, I'll just say, a decent yeah. leader. <laughs> and so uh, being able to provide feedback, because I think that's one thing that people struggle with as well. So finding a good way to do it that's in not so much of a negative format is perfect. That could keep the morale up of your team versus every time you're, <laughs> you think about it, if you, most of the time, if your manager director is like hitting your line, is you, you probably messed up a lot of times, unless you have that type of relationship where you have like one on ones and you're talking. So it's like, okay, what did I do now? <laughs> to where eventually, like every time you see their names, like, I know I did something. Mm. And that's what you kind of want to avoid when you're, if you want to give some type of feedback or something. So, yeah. But I had a question too, because I know I, I typically focus on the newbies. But I also have people that are, you know, mid career, have X amount of years of experience in that career. For the people who want to be aspiring, you know, managers, directors, C levels, what, what type of advice could you give them in their career path to take that next step? Like, what have you seen in your career from hiring maybe some of these people that they either have been missing or had in order to get those positions? Um, hmm. It's a very difficult question because of how broad it is. So I'm going to put right. some um, unnatural constraints on it. And you correct me if I, if I go too far off track, I'm going to answer this as if you are already at the manager or director level. So by manager level, I mean, yeah. M1, you manage people director level. I'm a mean, that means you manage a group of managers. Um, so let's, let's leave it there. So those are the you're at manager or director level already. So you already have some leadership, you already have you know, some reputation and some um, um, history on your resume, on your quote unquote LinkedIn, that shows, okay, this person has successfully led people before and they've successfully led teams of people that lead people before, one of the two. How do you elevate that? That is two things. One is, like you said, soft skills. 
The difference between the phenomenal leader and the okay leader um, is how well you are able to read and interact and react back to people. Different people have different things that work on them. Some people, you can motivate them with, listen, if you get this done, I'm going to give you $10 extra. Some people don't care about that. If you are the kind of leader that can't pick which one of the two, or you can't detect which one, you, you're not going to be a good leader. So the ability to properly interpret the signals you're getting, that's one thing you got to learn. The next thing, the best, 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 <sighs> got to be cautious about this because it's, it, you know, it's a little personal. I work for one person. Technologically and intelligently, probably the most brilliant person I've ever worked for. Like legit smart, holder of probably hundreds of patents, like designed computer chips, like smart, 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 like multimillionaire smart, like super smart dude. Like Terrence Howard. Say again? I was making a joke like Terrence Howard. No actual smart with actual. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. But no, for real, this dude is super smart. And I cherished working for him because I learned so much because the dude is just so stinking smart. Zero empathy. It never crossed, at least he never showed it. It never crossed his mind that the people around him might be hurting right now. Um, I remember, uh, I can't give that example because you'll be able to figure out exactly who it is. And I respect the dude, so I'm not trying to paint anyone in a bad light. Because for still, to this day, it's probably the smartest person I've ever worked for. And to this day, my career is where it is because I worked for him. Because th I'm applying today the things I learned from him, where he pulled me aside in his office and said, Greg, you need to be better at this, this, this. I went and I studied and I got better at this, 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 and it brought me to where I am today. So, like, I ain't throwing no shade at, at the dude at all. But he completely lacked ep empathy. You got sick and, you know, hey, my kid is sick, boom, 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 boom. So, so what? Your kid is sick. You know, give your kid Tylenol and come to work. And the person isn't doing that out of meanness. They just have no empathy that the kid is, what do you mean a kid is sick? I was once told, what do you mean your kid is sick? I, let, I don't have kids, but I have a dog. My dog was sick. I just gave my dog medicine and I came to work. Bro, it's not the same. Your dog and my kid are not on the same level. It's, it's two different things. All, but he wasn't saying it out of meanness. Just doesn't have empathy. So what I would say, understand how to read people, understand how to react to people, and grow your skill in empathy. Remember what I said about the airline attendant? You walk up and they flip on you. Empathy says, hmm, maybe they had a bad day. So you know what? I'm going to help them out. I've literally left, walked away from airline counters, walked to Starbucks, bought a, a, a sandwich and a coffee, boom, 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 walk back and say, hey, you've been very busy today. I'm just put this on the counter for you. Here's a Starbucks and a, and a, a pack of chocolates and so-and-so. Whenever you got a break, try it out. Oh my God, you didn't have to do that. No, I, I'm asking you for nothing. I want no upgrade. I ain't nothing. Just wanted to say, maybe you're having a rough day. I wanted to help you out with that. Have a good one. A lot of times I won't even do it in front of them. A lot of times I'll just, you know, leave it's, it's wrapped food, you know, a pack, a protein bar or something. Boop, put it down here. There's a protein bar for you when they're not looking. Who put this there? This is great. I just needed a protein bar. Yeah, I want no credit for it. But that's empathy. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's what takes your leadership from, hey, I can run a couple of people and help them to, oh, my God, my team is super high performing, which is what pushes you up to the next level. And then the last thing is there is a component of formal education. Formal education could mean you have an MBA or a, a, you know, a, a PhD or something like that. Could mean also you've learned from the school of hard knocks, but it needs to be really good learning from the school of hard knocks. So that means you consume data, whether it's books or whatever, from a, of a high level. Don't tell me all you read is you know, Facebook posts and TikToks and, okay, now I'm smart. No. To actually ups upscale your level, you have to consume data of a high level so that you mm -hmm. can start regurgitating and expressing yourself at a high level. 
I'm I'm not talking about Ebonics and you know y'all and you know the Southern. Draw. I'm not talking about that. You might have a Southern drawl yeah. and say y'all all the time, but what you're saying, you're saying it at a super high level, and that comes from your education level, whether it's formal education you went to college, or whether it's um, formal education in the library. You know, I've been reading, and oh my God, look how dude said this. This is catchy. I'm going to learn to be able to express myself like this as well. Or you listen to really, really high quality podcasts, or you read a lot of eBooks and some people nag on that. Yeah. You got to paper, read the book. I travel a lot. I'm on planes a lot. A lot of the books I listen to, the books I read are listen, put it in my airplane. I'm on a yep. plane for seven hours. I'm going to put the book on one and a half and I'm listening, I'm listening, listening, listening. And something will come up. I'll pause it. I'll write three notes. Oh my God, I like how he said that. So I'm consuming it. So whether you are the reading type, you like paper books, you like eBooks, or you like audio books, read, consume. That's why I'm saying consume data. So you're in the cybersecurity industry. You want to get in the industry. You want to be a great leader. You want to upscale yourself. You might not have formal education. I'll recommend you some books that you absolutely ought to be reading. We'll start with this. How We Got to Now. See this book right here? This book, as a matter of fact, this is good beyond cybersecurity. If you're an innovator and you want to understand how to take, if you're one of those weird dark triad people that walks down the street, sees something and says, I could fix that. That's an app idea. I could build an app for that. This book is your, your superpower. This book teaches you how people like you looked at regular old problems and innovated and made something that had never existed before. That's what this whole book is about. Phenomenal book. The way they talk you through it develops engineering talent in your mind. And FYI, this book was recommended to me by the same person I was just talking about. So... Leadership. You want to understand how to lead people, how to, to just be super high level. Forget the politics. This isn't about Democrat, Republican, anything like that. Leadership. This guy was a general. He led probably hundreds of thousands of people. My assumption is going to be this dude could teach me something about leadership. So when I read this book, I am learning from someone who has effectively led armies of people successfully for years. Good, good to read. You want to talk a little bit more cybersecurity is the last one I'm going to recommend. You want to talk about cybersecurity? You want to talk about one of the bigger events that happened, um, you know, in our cybersecurity history it was June 26th of, I don't remember what year. I remember the date because I was there when it happened at one of my clients. Um, and it was the NotPetya um, attack where, you know, people's computers were just blown away. Um, sandworm. This book right here walks through the entire NotPetya attack, how it happened, what it happened, des descriptions of it. And that guy, Andy Greenberg, he is an author. Like he's not a tech nerd. He writes for like the New York Times, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Look at the inside of the book. So when I'm reading, I'll stop. And typically things like that, I'm going to requote that, or I am going to read that and say, if any computer on, this is one of the quotes I'm reading, if any computer on a network hadn't received Microsoft Eternal Blue, blue Patch, that Petya would jump to that vulnerable computer and continue to branch out from that new infection with its Mimi Cat's trick. I love the way they phrase that sentence. The sentence is easy enough for a non technical person to ask inquisitive, like, okay, what's Mimi Cat's? What's not Petya? But it's also very technically detailed that you can see, okay, there's a patch, there's a virus, there's a vulnerable computer, and there's a specific trick called Mimikatz that they use. So you, you get the whole attack chain, but at the same time, it's written in a, like, I saw that and I was like, I got to learn to speak exactly like this. So you want to up-level your ability to take super technical top topics and break them down so that they're understandable for a CEO who might be a Harvard MBA, so not technical, but he's a business-minded guy. Books like this help you to do that. So EQ, learn how to read people yeah. and analyze people. Empathy, formal education.
That's the keys to go yeah. from, hey, I already lead a team. Somebody already trusted me and validated that I can lead one or two people or I can lead one or two managers or 10, 20 managers. That's how you up-level yourself right there. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, that reminds me. I think so far, um, I had, it's funny enough you say that because some of the interview processes I've been in, they asked me one time, they said, hey, explain the internet as if you were explaining it to, I think I said like a three or five-year-old. And um, I came up with a pretty easy one. I kind of described it as a, uh, if I'm talking to, like I thought about my little girls, how would I explain it to them? Sure. I said, you know, imagine you walk into a library, there's many books and all these books can pretty much tell you, I guess, like whatever site it is. So if you take out this book, this is this site or whatever. And so I explained like that the like, easy way. And he was like, you know, that was a, a good explanation. And I was like, I think that's one of the things I've probably been inherently I probably like blessed with not an ego thing or whatever, but since I do this, I do come across people on various levels and I know my audience. I know what we've seen. So one time I had a podcast episode with a guy who does threat intelligence. I believe that was the episode. And we were talking about the dark web. And so I said, for my viewers, I said, most of you have probably seen the Lion King. And it's a time where Mufasa and Simba sitting down and he's talking about dad, what's that? He said, you know, everything the light touches is ours. Everything that doesn't, do not go over there. I said, no, that's an easy way to explain the regular internet versus the dark web. Everything light touches is good. If you go over there, that's the dark web. And I think that's like an easy way for some people to understand things like that without getting it like totally nerded and, out. Because that's what a lot of people want to do. Like you said, they want to show that they know so much and, and say all these different things, but that they're sometimes missing the mark. And the person's like, I just need to know what's going to help me continue to make money and what's going to prevent me to make money so we can get the budget out and, and do what we need to do for business operations. I don't need all the other yep. stuff. I've had, um, I'm not going to say which bank, the CEO of probably a, one of the top five banks in the world, definitely in the US. So this is in New York City, downtown, Wall Street, that, that whole area. Um, and we're mm -hmm. meeting with them. And, you know, I was very junior at that point. And, you know, the person I was with, the senior person goes into the meeting. I'm there to, quote, support. Um, but my the the VP that I worked for afterwards, afterwards, like now him and I are really close friends. Afterwards, he told me, I sent you to the meeting because I knew you would do what happened. So I'm there to support in case any tough technical questions come up. I'll answer the technical questions. But the leaders of the meeting went in and they're doing exactly what you just said. They're talking to this bank president, and they're, you can hear they're piling on the acronyms. You can talk about DLP and EDR and XDR, and about five minutes in, three slides and 20,000 acronyms, CEO says, listen, um, I don't need you to speak another word. I'm going to ask you to leave. This is the end of that, boom, 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 um, because you're not speaking English to me. Um, and I think you're purposely just trying to confuse matters and you're not answering my questions. Uh, no, but, but, but I interjected. Okay. I hear what you, cause there was a question, the, the presentation, we're talking and the guy, the boss asked a question. So, okay, you're, you're sh showing me how you're going to solve this problem. How do you solve this problem? And the response to how do you solve this problem was we're going to deploy EDR, XDR, SOAR, um, DLP <laughs> and EP. Bro, you only told me nothing about how you're solving the problem yet. You just rattled off letters to me. You could have been saying FBI, CEA, DEA. It don't make no... So I stopped. Okay, before yeah. you throw us out, can, can you give me a minute to try to explain? Who are you? I'm, I'm just the engineer in the room. Okay, sure. I'll give you one minute. And I did exactly what you just described. I'm going to an analogize this for you. How will we solve it? We're going to protect. We're going to identify where your crown jewels are. We're going to put protection around them. And then we're going to put monitoring and visibility so that if anyone touches it and if any of the data moves, we have records of who touched it, why they touched it, what computer they touched it from, and where they moved it to. That's how we're going to solve your problem. That's exactly what I needed to hear, sir. Thank you, Greg, for answering that. I approve. And the rest of the meeting was me talking. We closed yep. close $15 million worth of business with that customer that afternoon. And I, I got no I credit for it. Gave a special note about you. Yeah. I got no credit about it for it. I wasn't paid for it. Like meaning salespeople get paid commissions. I ain't get none of the commission. I didn't want none of the commission. I did it for free because I liked it. I was passionate about my job. And that's the other thing probably important for some of your listeners to hear. You're going to spend years in your career doing stuff you get no credit for. 
I wasn't called up on stage when they were announcing who did great this year and who's going. As a matter of fact, that year, the guy that got told in the meeting, you need to shut up because I'm about to throw you out the office. He got invited to what we call in big vendors, President's Club. So they literally took him and the other top salesman on a trip to somewhere, Bali or whatever, whatever, all expenses paid because he did so great. He literally did that because of that meeting where I sat and told, he was told, shut up, and I handled the rest of the meeting. I didn't get invited to Bali. I didn't get paid the million dollar commission that he got, nothing. And I didn't complain about it. It is what it is. I was doing my job because I liked my job and I was passionate about my job. And I got the opportunity to use the gift of being able to listen to the question and answer it accurately in a way that the person who's asking the question understands. And five years later, the guy that I said I'm now um, friends with and, you know, we work together, et cetera, et cetera. He was like, yeah, that's why I sent you to the meeting because your turn is going to come. Give me a, give me, as soon as the right opportunity comes, I'm going to call you and I'm going to reach out. And I think it was 10 years had passed and my phone rang. Hey, Greg, we need you over here. Dude, I didn't even know you remembered me. Yeah, I remembered you. Remember that thing with the so-and-so? I remembered it. It's time now. Payback time is coming. I got you. Let's go. Yeah, you were being prepared and forged for all that that type of stuff. You know, even uh, what what is I can't even remember what he says. What's a funny quote I like when um on the Batman movie? I think it's the Dark Knight when he's interacting with Bane and Bane is just telling him like, you know, you adopted the dark, but I was born in it. Like a, a lot of people weren't forced in that to be ready for yeah. that, and you were, and then and that'll show in the success. We from simple it was life. Uh, you know, we were talking about interpersonal things. You're talking about money and everything, all these other things. And how I think I've said it plenty of times on, on social media, like, you know, a lot of you guys want $100,000, $150,000, $200,000, but yet you can't even manage the $40,000 you make. You know, why would God bless you with More. that exorbitant amount of money for you to be still living paycheck to paycheck? Yep. And that, that, and that's sometimes when it's not your time. Yeah. That comment that you said about being forged. Um, I already inferred once and I'm going to say it now again, I wish I could take credit for it and say, you know, I saw this coming. So, you know, I was preparing. I didn't, I was simply reacting to what I was passionate about inside of me and what I believe God planted inside of me. So, you know, when my forging started in the living room on that Commodore 64, like I walked through, that was the beginning of my forging. The next tier is when I went to college and I built the BBS system and I was learning from hackers and nerds around me. That was more forging. Could I have gone out and gone and partied? Absolutely. I ch did I want to? Absolutely. I was a normal dude. I had normal passions. You know, you want to go out, hang out, blah, 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 get girls. Except I chose to dedicate myself to this because I knew, I, I felt in my heart I, I want to do this and I want to be good at this. So let me put the time in right now. When I'm you know, on the planes flying and I'm listening to books and reading books, you think it's because I, I don't just want to sit and you know, relax and eat the meal and you know, kick back. No, but I know the, I, I have these seven hours. I'm going to use these seven hours to do something that I couldn't do otherwise. I'll give you the, a, another interesting one as we probably get ready to wrap up. Give you another interesting one. I invest time into my spiritual health. So I do stuff like I set time aside to pray. I set time aside to pray with my family. I set time aside to read the Bible. And I'm not here. I, I can tell you, I advocate for a Christian worldview. I'm not forcing you. If you're Islam or whatever, you do you. But I'm saying if you don't set time aside to focus and build up and be forged for that side of your life also, you're going to have an unbalanced life. You're going to be technically really good, financially really good, but for some reason, the spiritual side, you always feel empty or off. So it takes intentionality in everything in life. So I am very intentional. I was thinking that when you said yeah. that. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's, that's my background. I was a drummer at my home church, and my dad is actually in town now. He's a minister now, so we're always talking. So. Trust me, a lot of the a lot of these things are you know I'm, I'm being funny right here, being facetious about being ego. I could, I can probably go preach a sermon <laughs> or something. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you really quick about 
Octoscribe. That's how I pronounce it, right? Is it Octoscribe? Octoscribe. Yep, correct. That's an app that I built. Good Octoscribe. question. Okay. Appreciate you asking that as well. Um, that's one of and, that's one of those narcissistic things where I was walking down the street, I see a problem, and I was like, hmm, I think I can fix that problem. But go ahead with your question. Yeah, I want to ask you what makes it because I looked at it, it looks cool. I, I didn't even get a chance. Like I, I forgot what I was doing during the time where like you I were showing me like all the different things they like scribed about my videos. I remember seeing all the emails. And I wanted to ask you what makes Act Describe better than something like a Otter AI? Like if you used to compare it, like what's going to be the difference between that? Because right, that's what I use like for my meetings. And then like for stuff like this, when I transcribe it, I use a tool like Cast Magic uh, that helps me, which all of it's like pretty much using like yeah, AI. It's all but, the same, same tool um, in the background. My use case with Act Describe is very simple. I go to in most of my meetings with customers are in person. That's why I fly around so much. Customers get ready to spend a lot of money with you. They want to see you in the, in the eyes. They don't want to Zoom talk. So I found that when I am in meetings with customers, I can either be active and um, connected into the meeting or I can take notes. I can't do both. So I came up with a system with no front end, no UI, no nothing to record those meetings and then have AI not just transcribe it, but summarize it, pull out bullet points, action items. You need to follow up with this. You told the customer you would do this, 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 so you're going to do this, 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 et cetera. That was the idea that I had. Otter AI does that. Fireflies AI does that. Um, there's a, probably a hundred other tools that do that. My use case and the differentiation is we are focused on in-person. So not, we don't work with Zoom meetings. We don't work with Teams meetings. We don't work with Slack meeting. We, we're primarily focused on in-person. So the intention is, and that's one of the focuses. I'll tell you what the other one is in a second. The intention is you go into any old meeting, Starbucks or restaurant, whatever, put your phone down, you get it recorded, you get permission, of course. Hey, you mind if I take notes? It's going to be AI notes. No one has ever told me no. Great, no problem. Um, and then as I'm walking out the meeting, I can click done. I'll get the report in 30 seconds. And now while I'm in the Uber going back to the airport or going to my next meeting or the hotel, I could send my notes out to my team and to the customer. Hey, here's the five things we spoke about, Mr. Customer. Um, here's the 10 things that I need you to do team here. So it, it's rapid, it's easy, and it's, it's three clicks. I sit, I put it down, I click start, um, walk out, I click done. That's it. And I get my report. So that was one of the use cases designed for in-person. The second use case was I felt like it needed to be trimmed down on features for the sake of easy to use. So with Otter, Firefly, et cetera, they have a little agent. You could plug that agent into, you know, your Zoom account. So that when you join a Zoom meeting, it said, hey, you know, Henry's note takers joining Zoom. We ain't doing none of that stuff. There's other tools that do that. Good for it. I want this to be accessible to the non-techie executive, executive assistant, salesperson, student, um, parishioner that goes to church and wants better notes on the church services, the sermon. Those are the people. Conference attendees, you're going to a TED Talk and you want to really keep... Those are the people. You take your phone out, you turn on X try, put the phone down on your lap, let the TED Talk guy run, boom, 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 when it's done, click, boom. And now you got a summary, you got bullet points, et cetera. That's our, our specific focus. The other aspect of that is, yeah, I know someone like you, HD, you could trivially do this, um, you know, by, you know, to downloading the audio and sending it to ChatGPT or Claude AI or Llama 3.1 or whatever. And extra you could do that. It's trivial. It's easy. Any of us tech people could do that. I wanted to make that functionality available to people that are not tech. So my primary focus is on simple UI, three clicks. Most of our ads in our commercials say three clicks and it's done. And that's where our goal is. Easy to use, quick, effective. And because of my nerdiness, we're HIPAA. We're one of the only providers that do this that are HIPAA certified, PCI certified, um, SOX compliant, and about 12 other compliances because we're not keeping any of your audio. 
It's a one-time thing. We do the audio, we process it, we delete the audio, you, we send you the notes. You come back tomorrow and say, hey, remember that meeting that I did yesterday and Act Describe? I want to see it again. You better send us the audio again because we are not keeping the audio. No one, None of our staff has access to it. And we make a statement in our privacy and security statement, which is public on the website. We're not using your audio or any of your content to train our AI. So none of the meeting, I have doctors using this. I have doctors using this as their scribe. I have therapists using this. I have lots of lawyers using this because of that level of compliance. So they can take really private conversations, record them, get it transcribed, get the notes, and never worry about it again because ActiveScribe has none of your notes and ActiveScribe's AI hasn't kept any of your notes either. So that's kind of the, the differentiation. Um, other than that, go to ActiveScribe. A-C-T-A, -A, scribe. So the intention is accurate, scribe, acta, scribe, dot AI. Sign up. If you're one of the users from um, your channel, email me. Sign up. It's a free sign up, free trial, nothing. Email me and say, hey, Greg, I just signed up um, and I, I liked it and I came to you from um, Textual Talk um, and I'll give you a free month of usage. If you want to play with it, try it out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, but you got to email me and say, I signed up. Here's my email. I'd like the free month because I heard about this on Textual Talk and I, I got you, uh, you and any of your listeners. Glad to help with that. Perfect. Yeah, I'll have the link in the description. I'll probably include that in the newsletter as well. Yeah, that sure. way, Appreciate uh, that. They see it. They can use that. Uh, but that's, that's actually pretty cool because what you said, and see, this is how we know this is a security-focused show. What you said about being all those different compliances and not keeping the data and not training on it is why, like, for example, I've been in finance for the last couple of years. And they don't allow you to record anything of that nature because of those things. So pretty much leveraging something like that could help a lot because I'm not going to lie. Sometimes on those meetings, somebody's rambling or you got work or something you're doing. It's just impossible for you, your attention span to just pay attention to that thing the whole time. You're going to miss something. So something like that is essential. And that's, that's probably definitely, I don't, you probably have already pitched it to like some of the finance companies, but that's something they should look into using. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah there, there's, there's a big difference there. And again, from a cybersecurity perspective, you your audience will get this. There's a very big difference there um, that we are transparent about our intent to never keep the, the content and to never use the content for training. That is super important. That's why a lot of big organizations, big corporations that use Zoom or Teams, they disable the functionality, you'll see it below there, AI companion in Zoom, and I can't remember what it's, Copilot in Teams, etc. But when you click on it, it says it's been disabled by your admin. Why? Because oftentimes Zoom, Teams, Slack, and those other big providers are not that transparent. You trust that they're going to be responsible, yep. but you, they're not telling you they're not going to use it for this. They're not telling you they're not going to keep it. And we know from experience, they don't just keep your content. They harvest it for information about you, and then they monetize that information. This is why we're in a day and age today where if you're walking around and you talk about something, you know, hey, sweetie, you know, what do you think about that new Lexus? Tomorrow, you're going to get ads on your browser, your Facebook, and everywhere else. Here's new Lexus. Because someone was listening, someone kept it, someone harvested Greg equals Lexus interest and told Lexus, you better market to homeboy right now. He talked to his wife about Lexus interest. So we don't do that at all. It's, it's, a, it's a viable income stream, but we chose, because of my cybersecurity background, I'm, I'm very um, um, emphatic about privacy. We chose not to train on that data at all and not to keep it, harvest it, or do anything on it. Also costs more. That's why we're able to offer it for you know $19 a month or something like that, because we're not, and we have very few limitations in terms, a lot of the other companies will say, you know, you can only do 10 pages a month, but we don't care about a lot of that. Our limitations are significantly larger um, because we're not doing any processing in the background on your data. That processing costs money. So we, we, we very purpose-driven, take your data, summarize it, extract it, give you the transcript, et cetera, et cetera, send it to you, and we're done with it. We ain't trying to do nothing else and get nothing else. From no, I agree. That's one of the primary reasons why a lot of creators, including myself, why we pretty much dropped our subscription to Adobe. Yep. 
because Adobe has pretty much put people in this thing and say, yeah, we're going to use your information, train our AI. And we was like, well, we didn't sign up for this. So we're going to go use alternatives that are not doing that. And you have to at least give us the option to opt in. They didn't give you an option to opt the in. The kudos I give Adobe is at least they were honest about it. My gut tells, not my gut, my um, awareness of the industry and experience with, with you know tech industry in general tells me for sure the other big providers are doing exactly what Adobe publicly said they're doing. They're just not telling you. Um, I'm not picking on exactly. ChatGPT, but they're easy to pick on, so I'm going to just mention them. I would bet a lot of money that ChatGPT is absolutely training on anything you've ever given ChatGPT. Facts. Like For sure. You, it, it, a lot of it leaked out already, where some of their art that they were generating looked really suspiciously like other art. And did you train on that art? Well, we trained on stuff. What do you train on? Well, we can't tell you what we trained on, but we did train on a lot of stuff that was publicly available. And did you train on the New, the New York Times? Well, we can't tell you that we trained on the New York Times, but a lot of your content now looks exactly like the New York Times. Eh, we, we did, we did. Yeah. They're clearly training on stuff that they probably shouldn't be training on. Not all of it. Not, I'm not suggesting all their training data is bad, but there's probably a pretty decent cross-section of training data that, you know, now, if scrutinized, people would have a problem with what they've been training on. So, yeah, I'm very, um, I, I believe that Adobe will be using the data for that, and I give them kudos for being upfront about it. So that you, HD, and anybody else can read it and say, eh, I don't want this. So you can leave. Think about how much of your data you're giving to apps like TikTok and Facebook and, and you know, et cetera. And they are not even telling you what they're using it for. TikTok is an infamous one. And this is not a Chinese conspiracy. But if you just read the T's and C's on TikTok when you sign up for them, TikTok has crazy amounts of your data that they absolutely do not need. Geo data, where, not just where were you when you were recording a TikTok video. Just they're tracking geo data on you full stop. So whoever TikTok belongs to knows everywhere you've brought that phone. And they, they can easily then assert, you know, I'll, I'll do it from a man's perspective. This man, every three days, he goes to his girlfriend's house, not his wife's house, his, his side chick's house, and he's there from four to five. It ain't going to take a rocket scientist to be able to look at your data and see, holy cow, whatever's over there at that apartment down in, you know, whatever, Northview or pick some fancy district or whatever, he there a lot. Like, it's very easy to do that level of analytics and see, okay, dude sleeps here, but he spends every week here. Um, TikTok has that level of data on you. They, and they don't need it. Like, so yeah. So I'm I'm very, very sensitive to um there are a lot of things out there that 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 collect data on us that we just don't know and we don't care about. Yeah, I've I've a lot of things I've just kind of pretty much not given up, but like assume like, hey, it's already out there. Yeah. Just like the other day they were saying, Hey, you know, everybody's social security numbers are kind of like on the dark web and they got them. I wouldn't be surprised. Like a lot of that government infrastructure is so old and I just, I just see they invest money all in the wrong places. <laughs> I just keep it at that. And a lot of it is not government. And, um, uh, I agree with you, but a lot of it is not only government. Um, social security numbers are a good one. Um, social security numbers are generated by government and the social security, um, whatever department manages and controls all of them. Who else has every social security number? Those three or four credit, the credit bureaus. Pros. So you don't even need to hack the government and their potentially weak infrastructure. You just hack one of those credit bureaus. You probably got all adult social security numbers because they, they hold the social security numbers to calculate credit scores on them. Guess who was hacked? Experian yeah. and Equifax have both been hacked multiple times. So the likelihood that all social security numbers of human adults are out on the dark web, sorry, American human adults are out on the dark web. It was very plausible because those we know for a fact we can point the day and the date when these these um big credit um car these great credit agencies were hacked so if you were alive then and had a credit score then yeah probably your social security number is one of them yeah and then here would be the last one uh because i think we definitely got to do a part two hopefully in the uh i shoot in downtown dallas so hopefully we can do it in the I'll studio but um 
this last question, be, I know you want to talk about a little bit, is um, CrowdStrike. I know you want to touch on, I kind of like the magnitude of that. And and it was pretty interesting. I didn't know they they had, uh, it's, and people try to call it a monopoly. I wouldn't say it's a monopoly, but I didn't know that much of everybody's environment was touching CrowdStrike to that um, capability. Then finding out outside of that, certain companies operationally and IT-wise are lagging behind and don't have the support that they need to come back with something like that super fast because somebody, I was talking to a friend, I forgot what they, they but they were telling me they they know somebody that works for, for Delta and was pretty much stating like, hey, they are still using like some of the oldest of old stuff. I think they were saying they were using like uh, Microsoft Access databases for for a lot of the things and that they were taking so long to come back up because of other stuff. But you know, it was good. Granted, CrowdStrike had their part to play in it, but it's always good to find you a scapegoat yeah. when somebody like because it's not a in security, it's not an if, it's a win. So the win finally happened and you knew it was gonna happen and you weren't ready for it. And so now you can say, well, CrowdStrike did it. It's CrowdStrike's fault. Like it, everything's just CrowdStrike's fault. <laughs> so you see, you've seen them on the last couple of weeks going back and forth with Delta and CrowdStrike going back and forth and CrowdStrike stating like, hey, we tried to reach out and help you guys a certain way, but you guys denied the help. But in essence, I guess you can summarize, you know, from a sea levels perspective, you know, what do you think about the whole conundrum? It is. It's a great question. Um, let's wheel back. I don't work for CrowdStrike. Um, I have other than friends that are fairly high levels at CrowdStrike. I have no vested interest in CrowdStrike as a conversation point. So I have no reason to be nice to them or not nice to them. Like they're not my employer. Right. Um, quite frankly, they compete with us in most spaces. So like I, I, I have no reason to be nice to them. Um, but this is not a CrowdStrike problem. You have humans writing code. There's going to be bugs. There's going to be issues. It's just a matter of time. This has happened multiple times before with other companies, um, you know, outside of McAfee, because a lot of people point back, yeah, it happened with McAfee. And, you know, some of the same names that were at McAfee then were at CrowdStrike now. So it, it must be their nonsense. This is going to happen. It's happened outside of um, cybersecurity as well. You got software. Sometimes software going to have a bug. Things are going to go bad. Facts. Full stop. So I don't, I, I, this isn't a CrowdStrike problem. If you as a company don't have proper disaster recovery procedures that you've accurately tested and you regularly test them, like, can you actually do a restore? I ain't asking you, is the tape there? But can you actually, re do you have the tools you need to restore if and when something bad happens? And do you know the dependencies? That's the key term here. That to restore, I'm going to need an Active Directory up. And if my Active Directory goes down and I don't have a master domain controller, I can't restore. Do, have you prepared for that? Most companies, that's where the thing falls now. But I've been doing backups every day. Yeah, but I can't restore them now because the thing that the backup needs is blown up. Um, so that's a company process and process discipline problem. And that is often a problem in cybersecurity because the cybersecurity industry has made security and securing organizations that are non-cybersecurity industries. So, you know, airlines would be a good one. They ain't care about cyber. They care about flying planes. Candidly, I want them caring about flying planes because I want them planes to never crash because I'm on them a lot. So the cybersecurity as industry has made it exponentially difficult for them to do cybersecurity well. That's what led to this problem. So they, they, it, vendors, customers have multiple tools across the industry doing EDR and DLP and this and that, and, and they don't, the tools don't talk well together. Then you need specialized people to manage the tools. And one guy can only manage a network and this other guy can only manage the endpoint. This other guy can only manage the data loss prevention. And None of them talk together, and that's what causes issues like this. So this is a process and a process discipline issue. So anything we can do as an industry to simplify this and allow businesses to be able to focus on what their primary business is, airlines, banking, flying planes, et cetera, 
while experts do the cyber security part of it, that's what we need to get back to. Simple. And I say simple. It's not simple. So it requires a lot of cultural change. But that's where that's what I think drove this entire um, you know debacle with the blue screen of death. I will say. There is a perception now that, oh, my God, I didn't realize and you said it. I didn't realize that, you know, so many um, there was so, so much market share controlled by one vendor. That's not what it is. There isn't really a lot of market share controlled by one vendor. They've done studies on this. Um, the, the segregation of market share for that type of product is about 16 percent. So, you know, CrowdStrike owns between 16 and 20 percent. That's of the market of computers that are out there running, you know, these types of tools, 16, 20% tops is owned by that one company. So it's not like, you know, more than 50% of systems around the world are using this. But what happens in our very technologically connected world, there is dependencies and interconnectivity that are not obvious. So if your hospital AC controller is running that software and your hospital AC controller goes down. So, and your hospital is in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's 110 degrees outside. And now your AC ain't working. All of your other systems are up. Your MRI machines are working. Your doctors are there. They can pull up records, but inside the hospital is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Your entire hospital now needs to close down because you cannot control the one system that controls your AC. So that level of, because of how technologically interconnected we are, that's what causes these types of outages. And a lot of the airports that went down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it wasn't as simple as, oh, Delta had a problem. It was airports had problems with the gate controller. So the little machine that goes out, the jetway that goes out to the gate, a lot of airports had issues where the plane is there, they can't get the jetway out. So now you got a bunch of people captive on the plane and you got a bunch of people inside waiting to get on the plane, but we can't, we can't move them. It's not that we can't get tickets. It's, it's just that that jetway ain't moving no more. And there's other examples yeah. of that. One system in TSA goes down. Yeah, right. So no one can do um, the, the, the TSA check when you're going through there and they're doing the, the security scan and all the bags on the little thing, you know, for the carry-ons. That's, that'll stop yeah. an entire airport. Doesn't mean that every computer yeah. in the airport went down. Just that one went down. But no one ain't passing through security. So that means no one ain't going to on no planes. Have a nice day. Right. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, let me, and now that you put it in more perspective, I think to add more context to what I initially said was, I guess when I said so many, I guess it's because it seemed like these were like large places. So it seems like, you know, like you said, 16%, but if your 16% it's is- Still millions of computers. All these people. <laughs> Yeah. Right. It, it's like these big companies, you're going to feel like it's bigger than what it, it is versus it's not like every, you know, machine or whatever. And some companies that, you know, I asked them because I was, I think I was off. I took off right before the new paternity leave. So that day I didn't deal with it. And then I think at my company, they actually, they fixed it within like the they 24 seven. So I think they did like an incident bridge and fixed it in like a couple of hours. So people that came to work didn't even deal with the madness. But like you said, though, operationally, um, GRC type of stuff, like kind of preparing for those things and wondering, hey, what happens if, now they know, what happens if CrowdStrike pushes out a, a something they'll need to push out yet? What will happen to the systems? Yep. Where's the testing going from on Microsoft's end? So I, I think it was, you know, I think it was a good, you know, learning yes. lesson. I don't think, you know, people lost a lot of money, but it, I say it always could be worse. It always you know, can be. Nobody it got always hurt. Nobody. And I don't think we're done with the repercussions of it yet. I think more money is going to be lost. Some share value is going to mm -hmm. be lost. You know, it, that all happens. And a lot of that will normalize as well. But for the, the CISOs, the CIOs, the CFOs that are actually responsible for infrastructure, I think it's a valuable lesson on what do you need to do to simplify your infrastructure? What do you need to do to diversify your infrastructure a little bit? So if you got, you know, a lot of these big organizations have 100,000 computers. Some of them have mil a million computers, literally, one organization. So maybe you don't want a million of your computers having the same tool on them. So you split it up, 50% there, 50% there. So now you have a disaster plan. If, if X tool blows up, at least these other systems over here are working, so we have some level of redundancy. I, th I think more organizations are going to think about that, and more organizations are going to think about 
um, using managed services to just manage the entire process. If you if you had a good managed service in place, you would have caught that, hey, this, this um, um, update has some issues on it, and you could have stopped the update in time to where only 1% of your systems go down rather than all your systems go down. So there, there's things that could be done um, in different environments. So I promise you on part two, we'll, we'll, we can delve deeper into that and make it a, a real nerd out. Let's talk about the blue screen of death and other nerd topics without all of the you know, the EQ stuff. We ended up talking about a lot of EQ stuff, which I think. Yeah. Is- Greg, where can they, the listeners and, and the watchers, where can they follow you Good. at? Um, easiest place to find me and all of my social contacts. I'm not the most social media person in the world. So, you know, but the easiest place to find me is my one central website. It's Gregory Richardson dot AI. WWW, my name, Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y, Richardson, like Texas. Dot AI, Gregory Richardson dot AI. All of my socials are there. Um, meeting booking with me is there. Um, every my schedule where I'm going to be speak, all of it is right there. You can find me there 100 percent of the time. My YouTube channels are there. Everything. So and I do as you know HD can assert. I do um, like if you hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, I'll, I'll respond. Um, if it's super busy, maybe it'll take me a day or two to respond, but I will absolutely respond to messages. So yeah, reach out. I'm glad to. Perfect, guys. Well, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I know I did. And um, for the people that's on the Patreon, you guys get to see all the stuff first. So make sure you support the Patreon. Um, we got the textual talk questions, email address, access questions. And like I always say, until next time, let's stay textual and we out. Peace.